faith in the power of humanity to do whatever it needs to do because every single one of our presenters stayed within their time frame, which means we have the full time here. And I want to thank all of you for cramming a lot into a half an hour. It turns out a half an hour is not very much time. So we have a lot to talk about in this final session and we'll focus primarily on our last two presenters, but um, feel free to ask more general summative questions as well. Thank you, Drs. Keith and Hume for your talks. Uh, discussants, uh, anyone would like to start with asking a question or making a comment? Dr. Liverman. Uh, so I have a question for David. Um, and it's uh, hopefully straightforward. You talked about how somebody, perhaps even a smaller country, um, will uh, want to try solar geoengineering. And so my question is, do you think we need an international convention on solar geoengineering, and what would it look like? Mm, that's an easy one. Um, <laughs> fact is, the world isn't in the mode of making new conventions at much of a rate now. That was something that we did do. If you look at the big international conventions we have, they're mostly a long way back. Mm. So there are a lot of ways to restrain things other than a convention. I think, I mean, you know, my happiest answer would be a strong version of the framework convention that builds this in with some commitment to some kind of clear voting regime and that blocks unilateralism. I love that. I think that's kind of implausible. But I think there are a bunch of ways in which we could get the kind of restraint that we'd like to see short of that, and that there are ways that coalitions of countries could, could assert both their inherent right to protect themselves this way in principle, but also say that they're going to have a moratorium. And then you can think about how that moratorium is constructed. And there's been a bunch of different ways you can think about doing that. So I think, I think um, as much as a treaty might be nice, the fact is a lot of the big hard things we govern right now, we don't govern so much by treaties. We govern them not as well as I would like, but we govern them still moderately well through interactions of states, both weak and powerful. Think about the internet. So we govern the internet through partly this thing called ICANN and now its successor. Uh, and that was actually a US not-for-profit. It's a very strange entity. Now there's questions about how it migrates into the PTT regime, but um, none of that ended up with a new treaty, and yet the internet's a pretty important thing. So I think it's pretty hard to see we get a new treaty quickly as much as I might like one. Dr. Hegerl. I, um, I really enjoyed both talks. Um, I want to make a comment on the metricization or metricization. I personally ve very much welcome the carbon me metrics because I was really frustrated talking to some policymakers at, um, who seemed to, um, for a while there, wa there was an idea we do something about climate change and we say we do something about climate change and then the measures that were proposed were so tiny and would have made such a small impact that it was really frustrating to listen to, for example, um, energy saving light bulbs or something. And so having the metrics helps us put a target up and say, actually, it takes this. It takes at least that to address it. And you have to compare your measure with this thing that we need to do to at least stall it. And so I'm that is a reason I, I like the metrics, but I, I very much sympathize with, the, um, with David's idea that we, we need to go much further and that this is a, a, in many ways a spiritual crisis of mankind where, that our way of life is not compatible with this one planet we live on. And so I'm, I found it very stimulating. And I, so I, I, I mean, I, I understand exactly you know, how, how, how these, these metrics have, have developed and evolved um, and, and the attraction of them for policy, for communication, uh, for the, the ordinary individual. Um, but my point is just to push back against the, the danger of letting these metrics swamp these other modes of what I call moral reasoning. Uh, as though the metrics themselves are actually what matters. There's something else behind the metrics that matters more. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, this was pointed out way, way back in, in the, the climate change story by um, 
uh, Anil Agarwal and Sunita Narain back in 1991 with their uh, study, uh, Global Warming in an Unequal World, and they, they, for the first time, drew out this distinction between survival emissions and luxury emissions. That physicists, you know, concerned about radio deforcing the atmosphere, molecules of CO2 are molecules of CO2. They do exactly the same job in terms of radiation physics. But as uh, Agarwal and Narain pointed out, molecules of CO2 do not carry the same moral valence. A, a molecule of CO2 that comes out of a tailpipe of an SUV in America has got very, very different moral standing to a, a molecule of CO2 that comes out of a peasant woman's uh, cooker in, in, in the middle of India. Uh, and so metrics can obscure, <laughs> they can obscure what actually really matters when it comes to questions about human justice, ethics, uh, and moral reasoning. And that's what I'm... I'm not pretending that we don't need metrics, but they need to be placed within a bigger context, um, which I believe you know, other forms of reasoning, traditional knowledges, religious knowledges, uh, other forms of ethical, uh, philosophical uh, uh, reasoning can provide us with. Dr. Alley. Yeah, I, I'd at least like to suggest that you try Rather than either or, yes and. Yeah. Uh, we need metrics. We need to get started soon. Cumulative CO2 matters. If you actually have to build a new moral understanding before we move, we are going to waste time. It is very clear that if we reached an economically optimal position that there are very strong ethical and moral reasons to go further. But I, I really would like to see a yes and rather than anything. Well, that's why I said that uh, they should be subservient, that, that they should not stand on their own. Uh, and I would put, put if, we, if we don't have any sense of why we're trying to achieve certain things, which has to come from these other ethical, moral orientations, then what, what, are, we, what are we trying to do with climate change? <laughs> there, has, there has to be some larger narrative and purpose. Save lives, what save money. Okay, but that is a form of ethical reasoning. <laughs> but, but the metrics... Why, 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 well, well, whose lives are we trying to save the most? The, the, of course. Which is an ethical question. So, so, first of all, of course, science cannot produce an answer. We don't go from is to ought. Got it. So anybody who thinks there's some technocratic group of scientists where you can feed in all you know about climate and the economy and turn a crank and get the right answer, not happening. Of course, I think most people in this dialogue know this. Values matter in a central way, and the values that are getting young kids on the street doing stuff are crucial to this. So the values are informing the debate, um, but when we, driven by values and the dry politics and have our debate, when we actually want to do something, having metrics is, maybe there are better ways, but it's a way we actually get stuff done in our societies. You know, you think about air pollution, traffic accidents, infant mortality, we've driven all of those way down. And metrics played a big role. And that's not, that doesn't mean that the metrics just came from space or that people lost sight of the moral value of children or of not having auto accidents or of having clean air. That doesn't mean that people arguing about those metrics didn't understand the profound injustices and ugliness of dirty air. I've been in those arguments. I've been in the arguments in the climate rooms. It doesn't mean we forgot all that. But to pretend that you can just, just have a conversation and not have metrics, which I know you're not quite saying, but it sounds a lot like that, is basically to say you're not going to make progress. Dr. Liverman and then Dr. Hume, if you'd like to respond. So um, my reaction, Mike, to your talk was, um, well, first of all, I know I, I sound like I'm defending IPCC, and I'm actually, you know, I'm an Earth Commissioner, not an IPCC Commissioner, but the, we included ethics in the report. There are now philosophers and humanists who step up to be authors of IPCC reports, and I think our biggest struggle in the 1.5 report, which has an extensive discussion of ethics and morals, um, was the question of universal versus varied. Um, but when I saw you put up those five ideologies, it made me recognize that um, 
as an individual, I've got a bit of a panic going on right now because I bounce back and forth between those. I mean, one day I'm anti-capitalist, the next day I'm an eco-modernist, and it's because maybe I'm, you know, solution <coughs> addicted, that I want the solutions and I'm bouncing back. And in a way, for me, all of those ideologies are offering something for us moving forward. So it was a little bit of an artificial contrast because I think for many individuals we we're trying to hold many of those ideas at the same time. But I but I think that 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 in a sense proves my point <laughs> in, in that in that it is that level of discussion that the real action has to happen. And actually not all of those positions that I outlined there are compatible. I mean there are some deep incompatibilities, not least around economic growth. Mm -hmm. There are many people motivated through m moral and ethical, cosmological, whatever forms of reasoning, that actually growth as modernity has constructed it is fundamentally incompatible with a stable and benign climate. And there, 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 are, other, there are other people who passionately <laughs> will say that that is completely the wrong line to use to tackle climate change. So those are a, a contrasting positions, and those arguments are not ones that science will re resolve, but is, do, my, is my point. But do you not think that there's a technical possibility of growth that is not damaging to the climate? Yeah, p personally, personally I do, because I probably err uh, more on that side. But what I'm saying is that there are people of integrity and passion who do not believe that. Mm. And un unless we recognize that and allow that to be at the center of the discussion, rather than hiding behind science or uniting behind science, then actually we're not going to get to the bottom of how we act in the world. And, and that's why I push back a little against some of the protesters who, and, and you know, Greta Thunberg isn't the first person who's done this. Many, many people over the years have, have taken science as being as though this is, this is the moral ground or this is the, the, the ethical orientation that, that, that I need, and I need no more than that. We need more than that. And, and Greta's got that, but, but don't pretend that this is about uniting behind science. <coughs> Dr. Keith, and then I'd like to ask if Dr. Wat Kuti or Dr. Ghosh has something to say. I certainly completely agree with you, and I think you've done a really good job saying it. And I think that some of my colleagues who've been too tempted to you know, go in front of Congress and say, the science says this and you must do X, have really made a deep mistake that I think is part of what has helped to build the, um, the attack on climate science. Because essentially it left the opposition no other easy political next move on the chessboard. That is, instead of saying, here's the science, here's my values, here's what I think I should do, which is something more like the actual full argument. Because you can't just say, here's the science and stand behind it. I completely agree. By saying the science drives you directly to action, people who didn't want that action, then end up trying to, in a kind of mostly foolish way, pick apart the science and weaken it, and I think, and politicize it. So, so that part of what you're saying, I actually completely agree with. I think it's a, a really important point, and it hasn't been learned enough. We need to do a better job of separating these things. Me? Or if you wish. <laughs> Why don't you go first, Do you want me to go first? Um, well, I think well, I appreciate both of the, the, the presentations, of course, and some of it is a little bit over my head, but, um, but that's just who I am. And, um, but I do value, of course, the work of scientists. We've always you know, felt that there was uh, a partnership that was being built, especially through the AC ACIA. Uh, in that sense, so I've always valued, and, and I've, you know, <laughs> there's been crisis over crisis over the years during that work where I had to fly and defend the scientists' work uh, when it came to the politicians trying to squash down that, uh, that assessment that was so important for us in the Arctic and the indigenous peoples of the North. Um, but I must say that the balance has not always been there, so I truly appreciate uh, your presentation in that sense of, of um, putting that balance there in terms of the attention and in terms of the focus that is often put 
on science alone, you know, as the solution or technologies alone. Um, and, and that the voices of those, you know, when you speak about and on your presentation talk about uh, the storytelling and humanities, that really spoke to me. And that I appreciate very much. Um, and, and I appreciate the dialogue that's happening here. I'm just going to observe it for a bit here. Uh, but for me, um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it, it's that balance, I think, that needs to be said. And, and you've said it very well. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Ghosh and then Dr. Liverman, if you, sure. if you wish. Uh, well, <clears throat> uh, let me say, first of all, that I very much appreciated uh, your, your presentation, Mike. I think you're absolutely right to try to, uh, you know, to contextualize the metrics, you know? I think the metrics certainly are useful in the sense that uh, they're the only thing that governments today listen to. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that sense, or even activists uh, seem to listen to, I mean, because these metrics have a position within Western culture which gives them a certain power, and now within global culture. Uh, so yes, uh, you know, they are certainly useful in that sense, but I think you're absolutely right to say that, you know, we have to figure out, and exactly as you said, Gabriella, that, um, we all recognize, really, that at the, at the end of the day, something has gone wrong with the way we live. You know, and there's no getting around that. We have to try and find some other way. And are we going to find that other way? <laughs> well, geoengineering, uh, you know, I think engineering should be renamed, uh, you know, the, uh, the science of unintended consequences. <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> When James Watts invented the steam engine. And actually, the curious thing is that the transition from water to steam power didn't happen very easily because water was free, it was cheap, and it was just as efficient. I mean, you know, there are spinning mills in Scotland that uh, until the 1870s, they were using water to produce just as well as steam. Why did steam win out? Why ste steam won out? Because it made more money for capitalists and it allowed greater social control. And that's been the case with uh, every kind of engineering technology that we see. So, you know, spraying sulfuric acid into space, well, what could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Keith. Uh, <laughs> really, uh, but, you know, what, what can one say? I mean, you know, the trouble is, but I think one has that terrible sinking feeling in, in one's heart that this is going to happen. Why? Because over the last four or five years, I can see the discourse that comes out of Yale, uh, their, uh, their, uh, you know, their climate uh, uh, communications uh, unit, and from various other major universities, that there is this process going on of normalizing these, in, uh, these interventions. And I think at a certain point, we're just going to be told, you know, as, my, as Margaret Thatcher used to say, there is no alternative. So the disease will become, uh, you know, and even, and you know, who will, who will bear the consequences? I mean, at some, at some point, it will be, uh, you know, the poor, the, I mean, as has been happening with these technological and engineering interventions for the last 200 years, They'll be, uh, you know, uh, they, they suddenly we'll see that the monsoons won't flow in the way that they used to. And we'll be told, oh, well, too bad, uh, you know, that went wrong, but now let's move on to another step, something better. So, you know, I think really at the end of the day, when we come back to what Mike was saying, I think it all now rests on the young people, that they can stand up in the same way that you know, generations of chartists and wobblies and Vietnam protesters, etc., stood up and say, no, we, we need a change, of course. We need to change our ways of life, just as we all acknowledge that we need to. Mm -hmm. I know Dr. Ali, unless Dr. Keith would like to go first. Right. Dr. Keith or Dr. I, Ali, I know both. No, it's a completely laughable thing, I agree. Do you want to? Um, I will. Yeah. Um, so two things. Um, first of all, I think in this conversation, 
we're moving towards a misrepresentation of science, including social science. Because for me, a lot of the research that we've done on climate change, it's not about saying, we found this, you do that. It's about offering people choices. That's why we do so much work on scenarios. That's why we write reports called America's Climate Choices. It's saying, if our understanding is if you make this choice, this may be the geophysical and humanitarian outcome. If you make this choice, it will be this. And I think most scientists are viewing it that way, that what we're trying to do is offer choices and not advocate for a particular choice, allow values, whether it be in a democracy or within an individual, to then select the choice. And the second thing I want to say is, I think I want to dump, stop dumping this all on youth. I'm really glad you're active. <laughs> but, you know, you know what, you know, I'm still alive and I should be doing something. <laughs> I should be lying on you. <laughs> We should be doing it together, yeah. Uh, Dr. Ali, did you want to say something? Yeah, so, so if I could come back, and this all sort of fits together, but it's a question for, for David. So, so, and let me do the whole thing before you get mad. Um, I, have never, <laughs> I have never met the person who wants to live with high CO2 under a stratospherically clouded sky. But if we make fatal heat, I have never met the person who would say, let them die under a clear sky. And so this is knowledge that we desperately want. And it's knowledge that we desperately don't want to use. And it all comes back to moral hazard. And you have been, you introduced this, right? You have thought about this probably more deeply than anyone else. But what, can you expand a little more on how going forward we gain this knowledge while handling the argument of moral <laughs> hazard, which is really what we're all worried about, that somehow by gaining the knowledge that will save lives if we need it, that we will guarantee that we need it. And that's, all of the arguments I've ever heard on this are either off in left field or else they, they deal with the moral hazard of this somehow. And you have thought more deeply about this than anyone else has. Uh, um, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I draw mostly on analogies when I think about it. Um, analogies to other situations where these moral hazards or behavioral rebounds or something have been at play, thinking about what people said and how the outcome played out. Um, so I mentioned traffic accidents before. There's been about a factor of five roughly decline in mortality, in, in number of people killed per kilometer you drive in the US, say, over my lifetime. And um, that's been a big range of different things. So it did involve stuff that was pretty much pure tech fix, like um, airbags. And in fact, people opposed the introduction of airbags um, in print and with some seriousness because it would be a technological fix and just encourage people to drive faster. But, but in practice, what's happened is a, a whole network of things, some that are primarily technical, like airbags, but some that are really social, like graduated licenses. Young people know what I'm talking about, that you don't just get a license, you get a license of different categories as you go. Like many of us learning to be much more cautious about driving with alcohol, like changing roadways. And these things all fit together. Was there some rebound? Was there some classic moral hazard inside, I am sure there was. That is, if you, uh, if, if I, I, when I drive a car now, I am more casual than I would have been driving a 1970s car. Because I know I'm much more likely to walk away from a crash safely than I would have in a 70s car. So there's some risk compensation that goes on in my head, and um, I think it's real and natural. And I think that's true of almost any one of these systems, that the Sorry. interaction between behavior and uh, these risk compensation behaviors and these larger social behaviors are there always. But I don't think that is a reason, but in many of those cases, we've still actually really made huge improvements in the underlying outcomes. That's true in all sorts of health interventions as well. 
So the idea of some kind of moral hauser rebound, the idea that when you make something a little <laughs> bit safer in some way, then people want more of it, is it's everywhere. And I think it will be part of the way this plays out. But the hazard, of course, is there no matter what. The hazard's there, you can't get out of it. And I think it's hard for me to see in the near term how that hazard of solar geoengineering really would strengthen the forces that are trying to block action. Because remember, it's not simply that Exxon will say it. It's, it's, that's got to buy them more political traction. And that means that the forces that are fighting on the other side have to loosen up. And I don't see that in the near term. I don't see that happening in a, in a huge tipping point. But that's fundamentally a political judgment, I guess. But it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a deep question. I'd say, look at the other examples. Um, and, and one last comment is, think carefully about the ethics of saying that people can't be trusted with life-saving information. You know, there were people who opposed making the AIDS triple cocktail available in Africa because they assumed Africans would misuse it. There are, I can keep drawing these examples up. I think the bottom line is when there are things that can really save lives, our job in the technical community fundamentally is to tell what we know. It's not our job to make the decisions. Dr. Hegerl. Uh, one, one thing, though, that is different from um, between life-saving technology and, and, and geoengineering, um, or, um, solar geoengineering, is that you can't address um, ocean acidification, so some life will not be helped at all. And I worry, <laughs> I worry what, what this is going to do to the oceans, and, and that if we... Um, if we think this is, if this were, were the only thing we deploy, um, then it would be just as catastrophic, I think. Yes. If, if we stop emissions cuts, just keep emitting forever, and all we do is solar geoengineering, it's just as catastrophic or more catastrophic, no question. But again, if you think of the real world of complicated problems where there are many different factors at work, rarely is there a single problem, single solution, there are lots of these interplays. And it's not true that when we introduce one thing, people forget all about the other things they're going to do. So the answer is that ocean acidification is driven almost entirely by CO2 emissions, which we must drive down. But uh, let me actually introduce a little empirical evidence. So I don't think this is that convincing, but it's worth getting some evidence on the table. So if you expose people, including North Germans, it turns out, to uh, take, take them in two groups, expose them both to some information about climate risks, give them some money, at the end, you're going to ask them if they want to give that money back to pay for carbon reductions. And you take one group of people and tell them about solar geoengineering, and that a group you do not. Which group do you think spends more of the money, gives more of the money back to um, um, cut CO2 emissions? It's the group that was told about solar geoengineering. That's now a consistent result over about 30 experiments. With fuzz, the one I quoted was from... Uh, uh, um, Christine Merck, and it's a very cleverly constructed one. Some of them are not so well constructed. But at this point, it's just beginning to be something that you might almost consider a robust result. That in fact, when you tell the public more about solar geoengineering, they are more motivated to cut emissions. Now, there are a lot of reasons that might be true, and that doesn't prove that that's what will happen politically. But it suggests that the very high confidence that that will be the result might be overconfidence. So the On the subject of telling the public about what solar geoengineering is, there have been several people in the audience who have said, could you just do like two sentences for those of us who really don't understand it at all? Could you do two sentences on what solar geoengineering is? The idea that, say, by putting aerosols, little droplets in the stratosphere about 20 kilometers over our heads, we'd reflect away a little bit of sunlight and reduce some of the climate changes from, from accumulated carbon dioxide. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Could I just ask, when they yeah. give the money back, yeah. it's for mitigation, emission yeah. reductions. It's, they're not giving it back for geo Oh, no, no. It's, it's, okay. yeah, yeah. And there's, there's a bunch of different versions of these things. But, but, <clears throat> but it does appear that when people learn about solar geoengineering, they're actually kind of more incented to do something to cut emissions. Uh, it may not be robust. It may not last. But that is actually what, what evidence we have so far. And also, very surprisingly, in the last six months, completely opposite of what I expected, some of the U.S. right-wing climate denial organizations have begun to weigh in on solar geoengineering, and stunningly, they weighed in against it, whereas some of the big environmental groups have weighed in for it. It's very interesting to think about what are the political dynamics driving that, but I think part of it is that it's actually 
the, the part of it may be that the, the climate denialists still really believe they can win the argument that there's just no problem there anyway. But the and other part of it may be this kind of incompatibility that you can't both say humans can't really change the climate and, oh yeah, there's this easy way to change the climate. It mm. just makes no sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Before I turn to audience questions, Dr. Hume, do you have anything you'd like to say? Yeah, just to, well, just a couple of things. One, one just quick response to Diana's point about the role of science or social science. Uh, I mean, absolutely, that's exactly what science and social science are brilliant uh, at, at being able to interrogate the world, in, in, inquire into the world to see what would happen if we did this, yeah. uh, and to make that knowledge and that insight available. But, but that isn't how very often the insights of climate change are presented in public discourse. How many times have you heard the science tells us we need to? That's the media says that. <laughs> Whoever it is, what I'm, what I'm pushing back on here is to understand Winston Churchill in the Second World War, he, had a, he wanted his scientific advisors during World War II to be on tap but not on top. The question is here, we want science and social science and engineering and all these technologies to be available for us, but actually it is we as humans, as societies, as cultures, as political entities who make these choices. So science is available for us, but it is not telling us what these choices should be. And just one, maybe one thing for David, I mean, we've debated this two, three times before already, um, but, but let me put this to you. So you're a good advocate for doing research on, on solar radiation, and a lot of this in terms of how the Earth system would respond is conducted within computer models, and you showed some of those results. What concerns me, I mean, the various things that concern me about it, but one thing is, by introducing deliberate intervention into the climate system, you are actually changing some of the geopolitical risks and challenges that we're presented with. And you cannot do model experiments as to how those geopolitical risks are, are going to emerge. So one would be, for example, if two years after you started spraying in the atmosphere, the Indian monsoon was 20% below average, Immediately, people are going to think, hey, these guys were spraying atmosphere with aerosols. We've now got a collapse of the Indian monsoon, cause and effect. Okay. Now, a question for Gabby. Could your models then be able to tell us how likely was it that the Indian monsoon failed because of what David was doing in the stratosphere? Just, just <laughs> to and, be and, clear. And, and, and as, soon, uh, as soon as this happens, yeah, whole, you then whole, open up an entire new discourse. I am not doing anything no, no. in the stratosphere. But, it's no, rhetorical, but, David. It's rhetorical. Yeah. <laughs> but, 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 but back my, off my, on that. My point, <laughs> that's not fair. Yeah. <laughs> my, my point is that, that it opens up new fronts of geopolitical instability. Yeah. Because this question of attribution is going to become absolutely central. And unless Gabby can tell the Indian government <laughs> with absolute certainty and confidence that it's got nothing to do with what David was doing, where do we yes, go with that? Yes, that's, that's exactly my, my concern, that, we, that rainfall is too noisy, too unpredictable. It will take... My, my concern was more that the... the the ones, I don't know if it would be the monsoon or that rainfall reduces somewhere because it doesn't exactly respond like in the models. We have um, differences in size in the observed response in rainfall to that what the models do. We don't quite understand what it is. It could be, it could be even the data that the data have problems, but, but we don't understand. The data are not robust enough and, and rainfall varies. As we all know, I mean, it rains today and it doesn't tomorrow and, and, and it will take quite a while to establish if it was actually geoengineering or if it was just bad luck in a, a drought as we have faced many times before. So I, I can't see how that could be resolved and it could create a lot of controversy. I agree. David, Keith, real quick uh, response. It, it certainly could. I think that's what's what only is wonderful now is there's some groups really thinking about that. So Janusz Pastor, who is formerly the chief for climate for Ban Ki-moon, the person most in the middle of the UN system, is running an international effort to explore that. And I think there are actually lots of mechanisms in principle to, to manage uh, uh, conflicts like that. I mean, those, those conflicts are exactly the ones we've worried about for decades and brought up for decades. Um, and it's important to say that the idea of some fractional impact on other states by a state's action is going on all the time now. So there are many thousands of North Americans who die from Chinese air pollution and some Europeans who die from American air pollution. We can calculate it with some numbers. I produced a quick paper estimating how many people uh, died from VW's lie. We, we do a bunch of this fractional attribution all the time. 
Uh, there are already mm -hmm. are impacts from aerosols that we emit for air pollution that change the climate, and we can do fractional attribution for that. This is all already there. There are already impacts. We're making changes that are not a lot bigger, if geoengineering ever happened, compared to those changes that are already happening. So I think this isn't as far out of the norm of how we settle things in international negotiations as you might guess. There already are international liability regimes uh, for, for many environmental harms with banks and payoffs. So there's a lot of um, questions about trees. Um, could we not just plant a lot of trees instead of looking at uh, geoengineered solutions? There's also questions about, um, is there problems with acid rain? And my nine-year-old twins would like to know, how dim would it get under your plan? <laughs> Uh, well, that, that's the human choice. Depends how much you do. But if you're talking about the amount that I and people in some environmental groups are talking about, which would be doing it as one addition to all the other things we do mm -hmm. at the level of a water two per square meter, then the answer is it would be completely invisible from the ground, and, and really com completely invisible. So there'd be no dimming that you could see. And, um, and it wouldn't even make sunsets different in a way that was um, uh, particularly noticeable. Um, Sorry, the other questions were, were trees. trees. So, um, hmm, um, in a deep sense, the long-term carbon problem, and Richard could do this probably a lot better, is caused by moving fossil carbon from the geosphere, from deep underground, to the active biosphere, where that carbon can then equilibrate between atmosphere, land, and ocean on various timescales we don't control. That's what drives the climate problem. Or that one. Nothing you do about planting a tree can undo putting a ton of carbon into that system. It's just a fantasy. There are lots of short-term utilities. Trees are wonderful things. But a tree is not a negative emissions. If you wanted to make something like negative emissions, and it would still never be perfect, you need to somehow put that carbon back into the geosphere, where it stays for very long time. Trees, are in, the, the trees don't just last forever. They die. And not only that, their forest fires depend on future climate change. So if you plant a whole lot of trees to protect yourself from climate, putting more uh, carbon into forest stocks, you actually build yourself up a bigger uh, uh, um, burning pile, which can burn under a hotter climate. So there are a lot of complexities about risks. Trees are also dark. So trees in uh, northern latitudes actually can be a wash for climate benefit, because their carbon benefit is kind of offset by their albedo uh, darkness. Um, Short answer is focus on protecting ecosystems because you love them. Focus on protecting ecosystems for all sorts of other things we care about for ecosystems. Focus on planting trees because we love having trees. But don't think that trees are some substitute for dealing with carbon emissions. They're not. Can you also talk about if there's any danger of sulfuric acid, like acid rain? Uh, um, yeah, the acid rain. Um, uh, uh, short answer is no. So, so that there's a lot of different risks, but that turns out to be pretty much a non-issue. Um, if you did solar geoengineering with sulfates at the kind of level I'm talking about, you'd, you'd be talking about a few million tons a year globally, and um, we now put 50 million tons a year of sulfur in the lower atmosphere, um, or a little less now. Uh, uh, this is the stuff that, that kills us and causes acid rain. Also, that's concentrated. Um, uh, and, and acid rain turns out to be nonlinear. So that really is not an issue. In fact, one air pollution is a bigger issue. And here's a useful number. Um, our existing air pollution is already cooling the planet. So we're not seeing the full effect of our warming. If we stopped all industrial action now, the world would actually warm a little bit as we unmasked the cooling from aerosols. Actually, quite unclear how much, and not even 100% sure. Um, but but um, you can calculate the ratio of the um, warm, the, the, the cooling effect of aerosols to the health impacts of aerosols, because they both cool the planet a little bit and they, they kill us. And uh, if you put a kilogram of sulfur in the lower atmosphere compared to putting a kilogram of sulfur in the stratosphere, the kilogram of sulfur in the stratosphere is a thousand times more warming impact per unit of health impact. Mm -hmm. Dr. Um, on trees, um, I think the one issue is it actually is important to protect trees for the climate um, because we do not want more trees cut down. But it's not just about trees, it's about land use in general because <coughs> grasslands are important for carbon and agriculture is important for carbon. 
soil. So, <laughs> soil. Soil is important for carbon. So all of those are part of the carbon cycle and part of what we need to look at with climate. But I think there is one thing that's important about what you're saying in terms of impermanence of forests as a solution. Mm. And if you look at countries' commitments under the Paris Agreement, what's called the nationally determined contributions, there's a very large number of countries, including Canada and the US, who are saying they're going to make their carbon reductions by planting trees. And that is a concern because of some of the things that you were talking about. I, I think, I think um, what we need is sort of different colors of currency. So, so not admitting, or in principle, something that, that recaptures and puts in deep storage, whatever risks and costs there are, that is the, the gold standard in terms of carbon accounting, understanding the limits of carbon accounting. Putting carbon temporary in the trees and, and soils could be a terrific thing, but it just can't count permanently because it depends on the way the farm or forest is managed decades in the future, and there's no way to guarantee the way that will happen essentially in the future. A question for Dr. Hume. Um, humanities can indeed be a guide to morality and ethics, but how should we respond when humanities are used for morality that drives hate? Should I read it again? No, I... I think it was also cut off. There was more to it, but... Okay. Um... So what about when the ethics might be an ethic of hate? Mm. Like we well, hate I, fossil fuel companies or we hate immigrants, is that? You perhaps. Think, well, I, I mean, okay, so different ways I could answer the question. I mean, at one level, humanities as, a, as an academic discipline uh, mm -hmm. is, a, again, like science and social science, as a form of inquiry uh, into how the human world, the human imagination, our reflection on who we are and our place in the world works. And... Um, uh, humanities then uh, will identify, I, I guess, some of the ways in which humans cultivate what traditionally would be called the virtues, but also um, how uh, and in what circumstances um, undesirable human traits uh, are given salience or are given uh, or are animated. Um, so, so humanities is not, in that sense, again, it's a form of inquiry um, into how the world uh, works. I suppose the question about hate, as soon as I think of hate and humanities and by talking about religion, maybe the question is more about how certain religious m modes of thinking and reasoning and action in the world might contribute to a more hateful society. Um, and for sure, I mean, and again, we know historically how this operates, and in our contemporary world, we know how this can operate. Um, uh, so I think this, what the humanities can then do is to, re to reflect on, well, how is it that religion can act both as a force for moral good, but also as a force for moral evil? Where do those instincts, where do those traits, those patterns actually emerge from. And good scholarship, good contributions to public debates uh, will be able to temper those religious institutions um, uh, that are oriented in directions that cultivate human tribalism, human uh, 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 greed, uh, the will to power, and so on. Gabby was asking me before, I mean, I mentioned about the, the, the um, papal encyclical from 2005. Of course, many other religious traditions have uh, made significant statements and contributions about how their own particular religious traditions and practices would engage with the questions of climate change and the types of moral responsibilities and duties that come out of those traditions, whether it's in Islam, uh, or in Buddhism, uh, in my own uh, uh, church in the UK, the Church of England. Um, so there are many examples of how religious institutions have mobilized their own resources in order to offer uh, perspectives and actions that would uh, deal with some of the risks of climate change. 
Um, the papal example, though, is particularly interesting, partly because the Catholic Church, of course, is very centralized, so a papal encyclical carries much greater weight than in most other world religions. Um, but also the, the, the very holistic narrative that the Pope developed uh, in that encyclical, that mm -hmm. he took science very seriously, he took environmental degradation and change very seriously, but he placed that into a much larger narrative, which ultimately was, of course, about a Catholic cosmology and a, and a Catholic understanding of God, but also drew this very much back to the human experience of being in the world. Um, and so to me, that was a much... Uh, uh, well, there were a very good example of holistic uh, thinking that did, was duly respectful to all of the different modes of human inquiry and reasoning uh, that we have developed over uh, many, many generations. Mm -hmm. Maybe a, oh, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Maybe a, a, a question that invites participation from any of you um, comes from this uh, questioner who asks, how do we balance a fast response to climate change with one that, with a robust exploration of the, of values questions. So how, how, do we, how do we split that hair or, um, you know, uh, how do we tame that two-headed beast, perhaps, if you want to think of it that way? Or, you know, depending upon your understanding about the relationship between those two, and there are obviously dramatic differences among the panelists about their understanding of the relationship between science and values. But given how you understand that relationship, how would you suggest that we continue to, that we do the, both of those full speed ahead? Okay, so I, I suppose the way that you asked the question, the, the, the sense is, well, we haven't got the luxury of... <laughs> well, that's the... I am, I'm channeling a questioner right. who's saying, yeah, we really don't have the luxury of time here. So a couple of things I'd say to that. One is, well, it's not helped by putting artificial deadlines on when we have to act by. I, I, I'm rather resistant to the notion that, that we only have five or ten years after which it's too late. The idea of these, these cliff-edge moments it's never too late to do the right thing. Actually, if you want to look at climate change in a completely different way, which I think Sheila was drawing attention to through her experiences, it was too late 100 years ago uh -huh. for um, some communities in the world. So the idea of these, these artificial deadlines by which we have to act, uh -huh. we have to get to net zero in five years' time, isn't actually very helpful mm -hmm. um, because it's never too late. Mm -hmm. So the, and the other way of thinking mm -hmm. about these sort of different temporalities Mm -hmm. um, is that humanities are not, I, they're not going to offer you a solution. <laughs> there's, no, there's no end point. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a constant dimension of human experience and life. Mm -hmm. That's how we experience the world. We are, we are moral, imaginative beings. Mm -hmm. And we need to give space to, for those to flourish. Yes, science and technology will come in and you know, suggest we might do this, we might do that. Um, but all along, we have to give space to these moments to reflect on the ethics of solar climate engineering, as David was pointing out. Um, and that takes us into a more political jurisdiction as well. What are the mechanisms? And this is another question I would want to ask David. How do we provide these larger global um, forums to deliberate on some of these questions, because actually it will influence every single person on the planet. So that is something that the humanities actually can contribute to, uh, form different forms of deliberation uh, um, that allows these ethical questions to be put in the foreground. So in a way, the humanities is not time limited. It has been with us since humans first began to have a degree of self-consciousness about who we are as moral agents in the world and it will be there still 100 years into the future. Whatever happens to the climate, we will still be thinking about what is it to be a virtuous human being, mm -hmm. even if the world is four degrees warmer. Mm -hmm. And there is still a role for that form of reflection in whatever world we live in. Otherwise, we stop being human. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I would chime in on what Diana said before. We in the IPCC 
have just bent over backwards not to tell anyone what to do and never to say it's too late. The idea that the scientists said that we must do X is complete nonsense. The scientists said, if you do not do X by time Y, you will face these consequences Z. And we don't predict, we project. If humans choose this path, then these are the responses. That's and then there are people who do use that and say, well, the scientists say that we have to stop by time something. But we, and some of us have even sort of, I mean, we're people. We have opinions, we have families, we have desires, we, uh, I vote. And, but I sort of self-censor a little bit just to make sure that it's very clear that the science tells you what is and what can be, but that you're going to make decisions. So I do not believe that we in science are guilty of telling you what to do. Yeah. I yeah, wasn't I, making that uh, accusation. Let's go to Dr. Hegerl, and then do, Dr. Liverman, and then Dr. Hume. The, the direct follow-up, I, I totally agree with what Diane and, and, and Richard just said. It, it is, for me, as a scientist, it's really important that I, um, I have my values, and I have my, um, as you've heard, I, I have, um, I have ideas of what we should be doing, but my role as a scientist is to say what, what if, what, what do the data tell me, what does my model tell me, what, um, and my role in the IPCC is to give out these um, alternatives. You can do this, or you can do that, and, and this will be the consequence. And to be, and it is really important that we are extremely careful not to bring our values in through the back door by uh, making follow-up statement, therefore you have to do this now, um, which is driven by, by my values and not by my scientific results. On the other hand, I think we would be incomplete humans if we don't have our own values and our desires of what would happen next. And I haven't really found a good solution of what to do about that other than trying to keep those out of public discourse or or saying clearly, this is what I personally think, but you could come to a different conclusion. And I'm, I think most, many scientists go, uh, go about it like this, but there are some colleagues who, who, who mix the, both up in a, in a way that I don't find very helpful. I'm, I'm, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Dr. Liverman, sorry. and then perhaps Dr. Hume. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so I enter a moment ago saying it's the media, and of course the media is very differentiated, but I've been deeply disturbed by the 12 years and apocalypse narrative that is out there. Um, people have come up to me, my neighbors have come up to me and asked me about it. Um, I can see young people being really worried about it. And, you know, we didn't say that. <coughs> the science did not say that. Actually, the press release from IPCC hinted at it, but actually the alternative narrative is in the report we say if you really want a good chance of saying under 1.5, you actually have to cut emissions 60%. That was the most sort of secure scenario that we generated. But the other thing is, we just picked, I said this before, it was an arbitrary point at 2030 on the way to 2050 in order to keep things under 1.5. And I also worry that the 12-year narrative means some people think we've got 12 years before we have to act, and we have to act now, and we have to act yesterday. So the way in which the media looked for the simple message from the report, and the way that has traveled, whether it's into the Green New Deal or Greta Thunberg's speech at the UN. Um, I know it's motivating action, but I do worry that people didn't look at the choices we offered. They've picked one thing to focus on. So actually, 60% by 2030, if you actually want to work that narrative. Dr. Hume, any comments? Well, no, I agree, and I, I think it's great that, that, that Richard and Diana and, and, and Gabby you know, said that. It's absolutely important for people to hear that. Yeah. Question. Another question, um, I, I believe this is directed at uh, Dr. Keith, but perhaps for anyone. Who owns space, and perhaps they also mean the, the stratosphere here, 
Um, who has the authority to decide whether or how to deploy solar geoengineering? As a matter of uh, explicit law, there's very little. So for spacers and outer space treaty, um, wouldn't be decisive here. Uh, for the stratosphere, the answer is countries own the overlying airspace. Um, but their customary international law does impose a duty on states not to cause harm to other states. So no simple answer. I think that uh, that's being too academic. The point is, that's what we need to work out. And the reason that people like me are saying that we ought to be talking about this is it gives us a longer time to start thinking through the answers to those questions. So to me, the best way to come up with the answer to the questions about making those decisions is to debate it for a long time as democratically, uh, albeit imperfectly as we can, not to keep quiet about it forever and then suddenly figure that question out in a, in a time of crisis. Other I'd like to chime in on the engineering question, I think. Mm -hmm. That you raised. I think um, is engineering the science of just producing bad side effects. I mean, there's no objective way to say. On the one hand, all of us in this room and in the world today are fundamentally dependent on engineering and, and the continuous engineering processes to be alive. We didn't necessarily have to do that, but that's where we are now. Uh, you know, you don't necessarily see it, but there's a kind of bulwark, the whole existence of big cities depends on the control of disease. Um, we, we couldn't have as many people on the planet if we didn't synthesize nitrogen from the air at, at a rate as big as the entire natural nitrogen process where we deliberately, and it was deliberately, engineered a planetary process for, for, for human ends. Um, do engineering interventions produce side effects? Of course, all the time, and people try and estimate them, but they never get it right. But there's a long way between that and a claim that any engineering attempt to solve a problem is always doomed to failure. Because in fact, the record of engineering solving relatively defined problems, and solving maybe is the wrong word, but substantially reducing them and, and making the world better, I think is really strong. That's partly why we live in a world that in all sorts of ways is um, made better by the products of rationality and engineering applied. But it itself... <laughs> It, 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 it needs to be our servant. It cannot and should not, and technocrats could not and should not, make the decisions about where we're going. So the point is, the fundamental decisions about where to, where to push that engineering machine, what goals it should be seeking, are decisions that we as humans need to argue about and, and, and through, through our political processes to get to some outcome. But I think the idea that, I think, I get, I'm not saying it's clear enough, we are in a dynamically unstable situation in a planet with this many people on it. It is not an option short of mass death to kind of step off to a world without engineering. We're committed for now. We could conceivably work our way down from that world to some really different world in centuries, but for now we are completely committed. The choices is what social choices we make with it. Do we keep endlessly ratcheting up consumption and at the same time trying to compensate for it? I would not vote for that. Or do we find ways to ramp down consumption, but also to find engineering ways to reduce the impacts of our consumption? That's what I would vote for. And they will On be. On that careful. eloquent note, I want to thank all of our presenters, discussants. We are so honored you have been here, and we have learned so much from you. Thank you very much.